Hi you guys, this is Dr. Baker Townsend and I want to talk to you about the antepartum exam. Um, I'm going to go over uh, the antepartum exam with you on um, your first SimLab day. And the reason why it's so important that we get it done before um, we do a lot of the teaching is so that you have time to just kind of practice um, going over your physical exam. We'll talk about more on why you need uh, the exam elements um, when I teach you more about the um, processes of labor and delivery, um, postpartum, um, antepartum, but you need to kind of review a lot of your exam elements that you already know and we're just going to add a few. So starting, um, our objective is to assess the gravid patient, that means pregnant patient, for normal physical changes associated with pregnancy. And number two, to detect abnormalities in the gravid or pregnant patient, which may be associated with disease processes. So first, of course, you're going to look at their skin. Um, you really need, I want to move this over a little bit. Okay, um, you really need to look at their skin. Um, if they're Caucasian, of course, they should be pink. Um, if they're of any other ethnicity, which lends to a tan color, they should be tan. Um, but we really don't want them to be red. Um, that could tell us that there's some problems with pressure. Um, we don't want them to be pale. Um, that could tell us, obviously, that they don't have enough oxygenation to their skin. Of course, yellow is not a good sign. Um, yellow would be jaundice. Um, we see that with um, sometimes patients who are um, pregnant with sickle cell anemia. Um, they have a lot of breakdown of their red blood cells, and we know the byproduct of the red, breakdown of the red blood cells, bilirubin, so they can get really jaundice. And then, of course, gray is really bad. Um, we don't have a lot of oxygen-carrying capacity. Um, this is usually after a, um, a bleed or something of that nature. Um, so the next thing um, we're going to look at is we want to check for MRSA. Like we don't want patients to have MRSA that are coming in to have a baby. Um, the baby can get infected. Um, if they have MRSA on their back, where if they want to have an epidural, the epidural site on the lower segment of their back, if they have MRSA there, anesthesia will not go through a MRSA lesion. Um, to give them an epidural because we know it could cause a bloodborne infection or sepsis. Um, puritic uticarial papules and plaques of pregnancies. Of course, uticaria is the key word here. Um, uticaria is just rash or hives, and sometimes people get these in pregnancy, and that's a really a normal finding. Rash on palms and soles. Um, that's secondary syphilis. Unfortunately, syphilis has made a big comeback in the United States, and um, we really have we have to be, do due diligence to make sure we check everyone for syphilis, but it, it's a bacterial infection that can be um, eliminated with penicillin, but we have to detect it. Um, when they have secondary syphilis, they have a rash on their palms and soles, so we look for that. And then herpetic lesions on their mouth or genitals, obviously, is herpes. Um, that can be transmitted to the baby, and that can cause herpetic meningitis, which can cause anything from a fever all the way to death. Echomosis, areas of bruising, uh, if there are variations in color, that means that it occurred at a different time, and that's always suspicious to us for domestic violence. So here's pups. You can see these uticarial. Um, they just look like hives. Um, they're normal but very uncomfortable. Um, women do not like them. Um, we tell them gold bond powder and things of that nature. Um, MRSA, MRSA, methicillin resistant Saf aureus. Um, again, uh, really it's a terrible infection because we have more and more drug resistance. Um, and again, anesthesia will not go through one of these lesions on the back. So you always need to check that prior to calling for an epidural. And then here's ecchymosis. And this is varied pattern of, of um, healing. You can see this is an older lesion right here, whereas yellow. Um, and then you can see this is a more new lesion. It's purple. Um, so we always do um, mapping. Um, um, bruise and map bruising and mapping um, so we ask her what caused this one and then we document that in our chart and then what caused this one and we document that we talk about the different colors um, because um, between law enforcement and um, to help you know to look and see over years what's been happening um, this helps us to kind of look at that in case there is a homicide or anything of that nature of course, when we do the domestic violence screening and we ask these questions, we never do it in front of the significant other. 
Um, another red flag is when the significant other tries to talk for the patient. Um, you know, that's a huge sign of concern um, because they don't want the patient to say anything. So again, we don't ever ask questions like, you know, domestic violence screening, have you ever been hit, kicked, punched, beaten, slapped, um, withheld funds, withheld um, from visiting rights to see your mom or your children or friends. Um, we always ask that in private. Um, also, we ask STD history in private um, and as well as pregnancy history um, in private. And a lot of times this private time is when we accompany the patient to the bathroom to get changed into her gown um, when she's being admitted to the hospital. Some other skin changes, these are all very normal changes. Mask of glasma. Um, so sometimes when you're starting a new birth control pill, the estrogen and progesterone elevations will cause you to have a darkening of the skin on your face. This is before um, pregnancy, this one on the right, and this is after pregnancy. You can see where she got darker in her face. Totally normal. Um, usually it dissipates after the delivery. And this is Lene Nigra. This is this dark line. And of course it's due as well to the changes in the hormones when estrogen and progesterone go up. It's a normal finding. And sometimes you'll see these on babies when they come out as well because estrogen and progesterone cross the placenta um, and the baby has high levels of it. So you'll see this on babies. Um, Stria gravidarum, Stria is spelled two different ways, S-T-R-I-A, and you can also have the E. That just means um, stretch marks from pregnancy. Um, you can see these deep dark red ones on this particular lady. Um, these are breaks in the connective tissue um, that will turn to a lighter color, silvery or tan after the pregnancy. Sadly, they'll never fully go away, however. Um, the more rapid the weight gain, the more severe um, these are, uh, the more you'll have, and the deeper they will be. So it's very, um, can be very upsetting. So we don't want moms to gain weight rapidly. We want you to evaluate the face of the patient, um, facial swelling. Yes, the patient is your face swollen. Um, they'll tell you, yeah, it's swollen, or I don't know, I've gained weight. So you can ask them to see their picture um, from the driver's license. Keep in mind they did gain some weight, so their face may be a little bit bigger because of um, weight gain, um, but if it's significantly swollen, you'll see the swelling of her lips, swelling of her face, swelling of her nose. Um, that is very significant because that's third space fluid. Um, the vessels could not hold all the fluid. Usually it's due to high blood pressure. Um, the fluid leaked out in third space and caused facial swelling. Unfortunately, in your brain, when you third space up here in your brain, um, it goes outside of the vessel and that actually caught there's no where to third space it here so that actually causes what ICP so whenever you see facial swelling you really get concerned and you think ICP as well uh, neurologic changes um, drooping on one side Bell's palsy um, here's facial swelling you can see she's got a lot of facial edema here and here's her afterwards it's never good to have facial edema hand or face edema and then Bell's palsy, we think this is just compression of the nerve, usually due to high blood pressure again, um, and is compression of the seventh cranial nerve, and it causes drooping of the face. Um, and usually it can be a sign to us that, yeah, she may be getting preeclamptic or pressures are higher coming up to her face. Usually this resolves on their own. Um, there's no problem. Of course, you'd have to rule out stroke, you know, have them stick their tongue out, do a full cranial nerve assessment, um, 2 3 12. Um, also have her raise her hands, complete a full sentence, speak after you, um, just to make sure it's not a stroke because this can be very um, concerning to people. They think it's a stroke. Although anyway, eyes, of course, clothes clear should be white. Um, if they're yellow, obviously that's jaundice. Extraocular movement, EOMs, cranial nerve three, four, and six. Um, you just want to slowly go out. It's the box is only one foot in di in, in, in area. So you go out and then you pause, stop, have them look at your finger, go in. I do cat whiskers and then down, have them look at your finger. Um, you're looking for nice stagmas, therefore you have to pause in the corners. Again, you're going to come out and pause and have them look at your finger. Then go in and then come out and pause. Have them look at your finger, and go in and come down and pause. And have them look at your finger and of course you'll do the same thing on the other side. Um, nystagmus is when your eyeballs are squiggly like this on the corners, and it can be um, multiple sclerosis or cranial nerve um, irritation, which is what we're looking for. A lot of times associated with high blood pressure again. So we always check for EOMs. Pupils, you want to look at the patient's pupils. Um, 
It's one of my first things I do is look at the patient's pupils. And I look and see if they're dilated. Um, if they're dilated, they could be on antihistamines, SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, which we really don't encourage during pregnancy. There's only a couple that we use. But the thing with pregnancy and drugs and psychiatric conditions is it's a risk-to-benefit scenario. So if, she's, if we anticipate that she's going to go into a major crisis, sometimes we'll use drugs that may have a rating of a category C, which could cause minor harm to the baby um, or the patient um, during pregnancy because we always do a risk-to-benefit evaluation. For instance, if the patient was suicidal um, and we had to give her a, a grade D drug, a grade D is not recommended during pregnancy, but if it would save her life and save the baby's life, of course, we're going to do a risk-to-benefit evaluation and maybe she may need that for a short period of time. PCP can cause um, evaluation. Benzodiazepines cause evalu um, dilation. Um, big one is Xanax and then cocaine. Um, when you look at her and you're looking at her eyes and you just look and you see, does she have vasoconstriction? Methamphetamine, hydrocodone, fentanyl, and methadone are the big offenders there. Um, you know, always when you're talking to a patient, you should just be looking at them and looking for signs um, that there could be problems. Of course, we want you to evaluate pupillary constriction. And um, Perla, pupils equal and reactive to light and accommodation. Of course, we'll shine the light in this eye, and we'll watch for constriction in this eye. We'll shine the light in this eye again, watch for pupillary constriction in this eye, and that is called um, that is called direct and consensual. My husband's making crazy sounds over there, so he kind of distracted me. So you're always going to check for direct um, constriction and then consensual constriction in the other eye when you're shining the light in this eye. This is just sclera. There's your EOMs. You're going to go out and stop, in, out and stop, in, out and stop, in. You're going to go on both sides. And then here's a dilated pupil. Here's a constricted pupil. Here's Perla. You can measure the amount of constriction. And then accommodation. You're going to have the patient look really far away. A lot of people use this. They'll use um, convergence and they'll go, oh, okay, let's look for accommodation. Well, you don't really get a huge accommodation factor because it's just such a small space, but if you have them look at a distance far, far away, um, you say, oh, look at the clock across the room. And then you have them look at your finger. You're going to see that when they look at the clock far away, your pupil's going to dilate and open light so they can see that distant object. And then so the pupil's going to dilate out. And then when they look at your finger like this, um, you're going to see that it constricts because it's much nearer, much closer. This is just a video on nystagmus that I would like for you to watch and one on Perla. Um, evaluate lips. Um, just look at their lips. Make sure there's no lesions. Evaluate the oral cavity. Look for lesions, condylomas or HPV lesions or venereal warts that can be in the mouth. Uh, gingival hyperplasia is normal in pregnancy, and this is just due to elevated estrogen and causing the uh, gums to swell. We still tell them to brush their teeth and get dentition, go to the dentist, but they can't have any radiation. They cannot have any. Um, they cannot have chest X-ray. They can't have any type of X-ray or anything like that because it can. The radiation can cause harm to the baby. And evaluate their teeth, like their loose teeth, cracked teeth, broken teeth, missing teeth. Caries, which are cavities, um, that can cause um, osteomyelitis of the bone, um, which we see sometimes. And then dentition, we hope they have positive dentition because that means they have repaired teeth where they had a cavity and they had it repaired. Um, it's just HSV lesions that can be transmitted to the baby. We don't want any of that. We don't want it on the genitals. We don't want it anywhere. Um, because we don't want the baby to get herpetic meningitis. Gingival hyperplasia, you can see with these gums are all swollen like this. Still tell them to brush their teeth, but they can cut, they can bleed and such, but we still tell them to continue. Bros, broke or loosened, broke, broken teeth, loose teeth. Um, this is a huge anesthesia risk. All pregnant people who come into the hospital um, for delivery are at risk for um, an emergency C-section um, if things don't go well for the baby. So if they were had, had to have emergency C-section, of course, we would take them back for uh, general surgery and we would put them to sleep and that would mean an EGT tube down their mouth and into their trachea um, so that we could ventilate them and give them oxygen during the emergency surgery. Well, if you have a broken tooth, loose tooth, chipped tooth, any of these things, um, that could 
get nicked or knocked um, as they're inserting the ET tube and get pushed down into the lung fields. And that could cause a massive infection. So we look at all these things prior to, um, uh, we look at them initially on assessment and report if we, ha if we have any of these findings. Um, evaluate the tonsils. Um, we do look in the, the oropharynx, look in the back. Um, really important because it is can cause an airway problem. We need oxygen to our lungs. So here's our tonsils. Surgically absent or surgically removed is a grade zero. Um, then grade one, you can just barely see them. This is lymph tissue. Um, anytime you have an infection in your upper, in your ears or in your sinuses um, or even dental, um, these lymph tissues, um, you know, drain and really they're your little blood filters that prevent infection from spreading. So you can have enlarged tonsils after any infection. Um, and sometimes they calcify if it's a major infection. Um, here's three. You can see it, it extends to the pillars. And then um, beyond the pillars, you can see there's just a little bit um, where uh, there's, there's just a little bit of opening in the airway. Um, and it makes us very concerned because if she gets an infection when she has a grade three, um, we could have an occluded airway. The grade four is when it's occluded. You can see this is a difficult intubation. Um, getting an airway tube past these tonsils can be difficult. And then, of course, four, I mean, it's like almost impossible. So we look at that when we do our um, assessment of the mouth so that we could tell anesthesia because anesthesia plays a big part in uh, labor and delivery. Um, we can tell them. Um, here is we want to look at the tonsils, see if there's one that's really big or swollen because you have to tell them because, you know, you want to make sure that they know that's there for the intubation. Then infection, inflammation. Um, they could have strep throat or something of that nature. And if they have if they have that, um, it's an infection risk and also um, an intubation risk. Trachea, you want to make sure it's midline. We're just going to go here, make sure the trachea is midline, obviously. Here's the thyroid. Um, it enlarges during pregnancy. Of course, his is not because he's a guy, but <laughs> he's not going to get pregnant, but hers is going to enlarge. Um, women, when their estrogen and progesterone go up, their thyroid hormone goes up, and the thyroid can enlarge by um, one-third during pregnancy. So we um, are concerned about looking to make sure it hasn't enlarged too much. So we can see this lady has a really enlarged thyroid, so we'd have to do thyroid hemorrhoids, um, thyroid hemorrhoids, no, thyroid levels on her um, to make sure that um, her thyroid was functioning okay. Um, again, it should increase a little bit in size, but it never should get this big. And really, we just tell the patient to lean their head back and just kind of take a look at it, and then you can uh, give it to the clinician that's providing care for this patient on report. Heart sounds, of course, I want you to listen to heart sounds in the aortic pulmonic herbs, which is pulmonary to tricuspid and mitral areas. Um, I want you to hear S1 and S2, lub, dub, lub, dub. Um, when you get pregnant, um, at the end of pregnancy, you've gained an extra 1,500 extra milliliters of fluid in the vasculature, which is a tremendous amount of fluid. So um, with that much fluid, sometimes you might hear an extra heart sound, which is S3. So instead of lub dub, one, two, you might hear one, two, three. Um, which is just that extra fluid trying to get in. And so the mnemonic for that is not Kentucky. I'm not a real big fan of Kentucky and Tennessee, but I like this, this mnemonic, sloshing in, one, two, three, sloshing in, lub dub ching, sloshing in. It just means there's extra fluid coming in. So an S3 can be okay. A murmur might be okay because there's so much fluid coming in. Um, and it only a systolic murmur. We never like a diastolic and a murmur is just turbulent blood flow um, during pregnancy. That's a big one. Um, one of the valves that acts up on us during pregnancy a lot of time is the mitral valve. A lot of these young women go undiagnosed with mitral valve prolapse um, during their adolescent years. They get pregnant. They gain this 1,500 of extra fluid volume. Um, and then this murmur becomes uh, apparent. Um, a lot of times with mitral valve prolapse, you guys, they can have decreased oxygenation from the left ventricle trying to push out. Um, that They'll get really lightheaded and sometimes they'll even pass out. So anytime someone feels lightheaded, they have chest pain, shortness of breath, anything at all like that, always take them serious during pregnancy because if it's ever blown off, it could be potentially lethal. So really important to assess. Of course, I want you to come down, find the angle of Louis, come over here um, to the aortic area so you can find your angle of Louis, second intercostal, 
aortic bubonic herbs, which is um, pulmonary two, tricuspid, and then mitral. Mitral can be in the fifth here, down here. And so I'm going to expect for you to be able to auscultate uh, lung sounds. Uh, murmurs, there's just grades of murmurs. I just kind of wanted to tell you that. Move this over, sorry. Um, there are just grades of murmurs, and a faint murmur is a grade one. You can barely hear it. Um, a thrill is when you can feel the chest vibrating because of the turbulent blood flow. So um, a grade three is loud without a thrill. Grade four is loud with a thrill. And then a grade six can be, you don't even have to have the stethoscope on the chest wall. Like you can hear it. And um, there's a loud thrill. Terrible. Um, inspect respiration. So I want you to do um, a respiratory evaluation. Uh oh, sorry about that. Let me move this thing around again. Uh, respiratory evaluation. Um, the uterus like grows. So, you know, all pregnancy is, is a baby growing inside of the uterus, which is a muscle. And so all, and when it grows, 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 it puts pressure on the diaphragm. Uh, this can cause a little bit of shortness of breath, but the respiration should be uh, relatively the same, 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Um, auscultate the lung sounds um, on the pregnant patient. Um, and this is a screening assessment. Let me go on to the next video, so, I mean the next slide so you can see, sorry. Um, I want you to do the upper lobes and the lower lobes anteriorly, the upper lobes and the lower lobes posterior, and then the lateral lobes. Um, it's just because this woman cannot really tolerate you doing eight breath sounds on the front, eight breath sounds on the back, <laughs> three on the right and two on the left. I mean, she feels like she's going to pass out just because there's just too much. So we do a screening lung assessment again, four on the front, four on the back, two lateral. If you get any adventitious sounds such as wheezes or crackles, um, anything like that, then you guys, of course, we're going to go ahead and do eight in the front, eight in the back, three on the right, two on the left and find out what's going on. We can also use tactile phrematis. Um, percussion in the fields. If we think there's an area of consolidation, she could have pneumonia if she had the flu. And of course, we always want to do an oxygen saturation. Um, it's going to give you the waveform. It's going to tell you how many respirations per minute she has and the percent of oxygenation um, to her tissue. So we want her to be 95 to 100%. So you guys, when you um, auscultate, um, um, when you're auscultating for bowel sounds, um, this pregnant uterus, this big muscle that contains this baby, every every week it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You can see here's 12 weeks. At 20 weeks, this is the umbilicus. You see at 36 weeks, we're up here at the xiphoid process. So this big, gigantic muscle push, pushes the ileum and the colon over and out of the way. So when you're auscultating for bowel sounds, you're going to have to go out to the lateral aspects to get your upper and lower um, bowel sounds. Fundal height, so now you guys, the fundal height, the fundus is the top of the uterus. That's why I say fundus about a million times during every lecture. So the fundal height's the top of the uterus. So you're trying to see how big the baby is. So um, at 20 weeks, the um, top of the uterus or the fundus should be at the umbilicus. And then every week after that, it should grow one centimeter. Um, due to our population, um, we have great, awesome um, people who are five feet tall in our population. We also have great, awesome people who are seven and a half feet tall. That size discrepancy or variation um, gives us a plus or minus two um, variation in, in fundal height. So if you're 20 weeks, ideally, um, you should be, the fundus should be at the umbilicus or at 20 centimeters from the pubic bone. Um, but given the size variance, it can be at 18 weeks for a smaller person or at 22 weeks, uh, at 22 centimeters for a larger person, and that's still completely normal. If it gets past the plus or minus two variation, um, then that's a problem. That means, so say for instance, we're 30 weeks um, and the baby's, then the fundal height from the pubis to the fundus is measuring uh, 38. We have a very big baby and we're concerned about gestational diabetes or maternal overnutrition, something of that nature. Um, conversely, if we're at 30 weeks and we're measuring 24 centimeters, we are concerned because we may have a placental problem where the placenta can't deliver um, nutrients to the baby. Um, we could have a cord problem. We may have maternal undernutrition. So um, funnel height is really important in assuring us that the baby is growing appropriately. Um, so that's nice. 
Also with bundle height, there's another thing that you can do is if someone comes into the hospital and they're just dropping in, meaning they haven't had prenatal care and they just drop in to have the baby, which we still appreciate that they came to the hospital for delivery, which is safer. Um, but we would like for them to have prenatal care, obviously. Um, but we do have a lot of drop-ins now because people are using drugs far more than they have in the last 10 years. Uh, they don't want to be detected for using these drugs, so they avoid prenatal care. So we don't have any information when they come in. So you can do a fundal height measure from the symphysis pubis to the top of the uterus and kind of get a gross estimate of how old the baby is. So, um, so for instance, if I measured um, the fundal height and I got a 32, I'd say, oh, this baby's approximately 30 to 34 weeks gestational age. And that's important because we know that the baby's lungs um, are one of the last things to develop and they're super important for breathing. And so we really need to get kind of an idea of who needs to be at the delivery. So that's something that, such as respiratory um, or the NICU or whatever. So um, you guys, that's really important that we could use that gross measurement as well. You can see this is how we measure it. There's the pubic synthesis of the bone all the way up to the top of the uterus, the fundus. And um, you can see that this is how it grows. Okay. Okay, fetal evaluation. Um, so next you're going to kind of try to find out what position the baby's in. And we use this maneuver called Leopold's maneuver um, to see that. And we can see... Um, there's one, two, three, four maneuvers. So on the first one, we feel what's in the top? What's in the top of this uterus? If it's a large round mass that when you move it, the whole fetus moves, that's a very good sign that that is a butt and that um, the baby is in a head down position or a vertex position. We also say, do you feel the kicking up here? We ask mom, do you feel kicking? It's usually these small parts kicking up high, which is a very positive sign. Um, maneuver two, we go to the sides of the uterus and we really, really want it to be smooth on one side and maybe some small parts on the other. And that just tells us it's a smooth back. Um, that could be that way for a breech or a vertex or head down baby. Maneuver number three, we say what's coming into the pelvis. If we have a large round hard mass and we can move it independently and the whole baby does not move, that's a very good sign that that's the head. And then we turn around and now we face her feet and we try to see, is this head in the pubis symphysis? So we try to put our fingers between the head of the baby and the pubic symphysis and we try to see is the baby engaged or is down there low. This first YouTube video is me doing a, showing you a very quick Leopold assessment. And then the second one is a great assessment, which is heart tones, Leopold's, um, and fundal height by um, a midwife in North Carolina. So I encourage you to watch both of those. Lastly, we're going to find out, we, first of all, we find out our position is our baby breech. Um, and is the baby in a breech position, which is head up? Is the baby in, in a um, head down position, which is vertex, which is 95% of the time? Or is the baby in the transverse position? And so depending on what position you got with the Leopold's maneuvers, that depends on where you're going to hear your fetal heart tones. So you're going to look right here. So if the baby's head is down, here's the umbilicus. You're going to hear the heart tones below the umbilicus because that's where the baby's heart is. And this is always a very good sign. Babies are head down 95% of the time. Um, and this is very positive. If the baby's in a breech position, here is the umbilicus. You'll see the heart tones will be above the umbilicus because the baby's heart is above. Um, so this tells us usually when the heart tones are above that the baby's in a breech position. And then transverse lie or shoulder presentation, um, when they're like this, you guys, the heart tones are right on the line of the umbilicus. I know I did it a little bit low here. I should have put the heart a little bit higher. They're usually right in line with the umbilicus. So 95% of the time the baby's heads are down, which is always very good. You'll hear the heart tones below the umbilicus. Um, if you hear them above, that could be a warning sign to us that the baby's in a breech position. Normal heart rate is 110 to 160. Um, 110 to 120 is normal if the fetus has always been such. If it's a new onset, it's bradycardia. So say for instance, the patient has got prenatal care the whole time, the heart rate was running 115, 118, 112, that's completely fine. But 
if the baby has been running 140s, 150s, all through prenatal care, and now she's in the hospital and it dips down to 110 or anything below 120, then that is considered bradycardia. Um, bradycardia less than anything from 110 to 120, and, and bradycardia, the reason for that is decreased oxygenation. When the baby does not have enough oxygen, the heart rate de decreases and the baby will get uh, bradycardic. Sadly, that leads to increase, the, obviously that is decreased O2, increased CO2, which is acidosis. Acidosis leads to brain damage. So we're always concerned um, if the baby becomes bradycardic and usually um, imminent interventions are necessary. Tachycardia greater than 160 could be um, drug use um, from the mom. Um, of course, like methamphetamine, anything that increases the maternal heart rate um, can increase the baby's heart rate because it can cross the placenta. Uh, and the second thing is infection. Infection can cause the heart rate to be over 160. Um, you know, just like with moms if or anyone who gets an infection, um, they get tachycardic when their fever goes up. Ways to listen for the fetal heart tones. Here's a Doppler. And you can see, obviously, this baby's head is down. It's below the umbilicus. And then you can too. It sounds like um, with the Doppler, it will display a monitor. This is actually an ultrasound, which uses Doppler type mechanism um, to detect the fetal heart tones. And so this is um, the ultrasound. And this is actually a, a dyno, I mean, a tach, a, a tach I'm sorry. I don't, I, I'm sorry, a toco dynamometer. Sorry about that. I had trouble getting it out. But toco is Latin for uterus and then dynamometer, obviously a meter. Mm -hmm. So there's a little button behind this. And so when mom gets a contraction, it presses this little button and shows a waveform on the fetal monitoring strip. So it's kind of interesting. A cervical exam. So the cervix, so remember, all that um, pregnancy is is a baby growing in the muscle that is known as the uterus. At the bottom of the uterus is the cervix, and um, the cervix remains closed um, the whole time you're pregnant, remains closed when you're not pregnant. Um, but as labor comes to pass, when the cervix opens, the contents of the uterus can no longer be held in. So I like to call the cervix the door to the uterus. So if the door is closed, the contents will remain inside. If the door opens, um, meaning effaces and dilates, the contents of the uterus will be expelled. So there are three um, forms of doing a cervical exam. And this is a digital, meaning using your two fingers, digital exam. And you will check for effacement, station, and dilation of the cervix or the opening to the uterus or the bottom of the uterus. First of all, effacement is 0 to 100% effacement. And this is 0% efface. The cervix is long and thick and closed, and it's not going. the door is not going to open. This door has to thin out before it can open. So effacement is the thinning of the door. Okay, so it has to thin out. This is 0% efface. This is 50% efface. You can see it's half the length of this one. And this is 100% efface. You can see it's paper tissue thin. So if you wanted to have the baby today, if I told you you were 0% efface, you would not be happy. But if I told you you were 100% efface, you would be very happy. Because actually what happens is this fetal head, once you're effaced, every single contraction puts mechanical pressure or pressure on the cervix and that manually dilates the cervix. So on this one, you could have contractions all day. It's not thin enough to dilate. This one, when you're 100% of ACE, those contractions put pressure on that and it just pushes the cervix out of the way and causes it to dilate. And here's a little YouTube video about cervical dilation. Effacement. I mean, I'm sorry, dilation. So here is a completely dilated cervix. You can see there's the cervix has come back away. Um, and then you can see here's one centimeter, three centimeter, five centimeters. It goes all the way up to 10 centimeters of dilation. One centimeter is your fingertip. Um, four centimeters is like an Oreo cookie. Um, a donut is like eight centimeters. So you guys, um, these are just measurements that we come to learn and when we're doing um, cervical exams. But dilation, if you want to have your baby today, if I told you you were one centimeter dilated, you would not be very happy. But if you were 
or four centimeters dilated, 100% effaced, that would mean that every single contraction would mechanically change your cervix. At 10 centimeters, you can push the baby out. Um, station, um, station is how far the baby is down into the pelvis. So these ischial spines right here are the smallest diameter of the pelvis, and that's actually where the cervix sits. So when the baby gets to a zero station, every single contraction is going to cause mechanical pressure onto the cervix and cause the cervix to change. So where the baby is in the pelvis is ultimately very important um, to how effective the contractions are going to be. So we want the baby at zero station. Um, so that it can mechanically change the, the um, cervix. Um, minus three, these are centimeters above the ischial spines of the pelvis. This is oh, not good. If I told you you were minus three station, you were 20% uh, effaced, and you were one centimeter dilated, does not look good that you're going to have the baby today. But if I told you that you were 100% effaced at a zero station, meaning every single contraction, the baby's head is going to press on your cervix and dilate it, um, and then you are four centimeters dilated, you would be very happy because it looked like you would have your baby today. And then plus four is out the door. So zero is at the cervix. High numbers, not so good, means it's up high, not a lot of pressure. Positive num numbers means it's past the cervix, um, and those are very good. Amniotic fluid, so your baby floats in this amniotic fluid during pregnancy. Um, this amniotic fluid can break. Well, the amniotic sac, you know, really is great because it um, cushions the baby, um, prevents contractures, your baby floats in it, um, provides temperature, warmth for your baby, allows for growth, um, and, and also amniotic fluid is awesome because your baby inhales the amniotic fluid um, like a breathing exercise and gets it into his or her lungs and then breathes in. The amniotic fluid and breathes out. Of course, the baby gets no oxygen from that, but gets actual like um, fetal lung maturity from breathing in and exercising his or her lungs with the amniotic fluid. Also, your baby drinks the amniotic fluid and urinates it out, and this helps with kidney maturation. So, you guys, when you're doing an evaluation or assessment on an antepartum patient, you always ask, Is your water broken? If they say yes, you're going to evaluate coat. Is the color, was is it clear or straw colored, which is normal? Um, red is bleeding, brown and black and green are associated with a, um, with a bradycardic event in utero and then the baby got stressed and had a bowel movement. Those are very not good. That's called meconium staining. Is there an odor? Should not have an odor. Um, if there's a foul odor, that's usually bacteria. Um, that's not good. That could indicate infection. May swell sweet due to the increased glucose and in the amniotic fluid, which can be normal. The amount that comes out is varied. Um, after the water breaks, you guys, that water sac is a seal for your baby. It's sealed inside of you, inside of your uterus, and so no bacteria can get in through your vagina. But once the water breaks, E. coli can migrate upward. Um, any bacterial infections, gonorrhea, chlamydia, can migrate upward and can affect the baby. And so, you guys, after the water breaks, if the patient is term, if the, ba if the baby is past 37 weeks, um, we want her to have uh, the baby within 24 hours. And at 18 hours, we start giving antibiotics because we know that now that that water is broken, bacteria can invade, and go to the placenta, and go to the baby and cause a major infection. So we take their temperature one hour, after, uh, every hour after um, the water breaks to make sure that they don't have a rise in temperature. Oh, I forgot this. Um, when the water breaks, the first thing we listen for is change in fetal heart tones. We hope that the fetal heart tones do not change. We hope that the heart rate stays the same. If it's been running 130s, we want it to stay 130s. If it dips down to like 110s or 100, when the baby comes down, this is a great video right here that shows you when the water breaks and how the baby's head will come down. It can compress the, um, the, um, the cord. Um, the umbilical cord, and that can decrease the amount of oxygen to the baby, and then that could cause the heart rate to go down. So the th biggest thing we do when the water breaks is we listen for fetal heart tones, and then we every hour after that we take a temperature and make sure that there's no infection. Um, we want to evaluate lower limbs of mom, so you want to look for color changes. Um, you want them to be symmetric in color. Uh, you want them to be symmetric in size. 
Um, if one of them has erythema, we're super concerned about a DVT. Um, when you get pregnant and your estrogen goes up, um, this changes the coagulation factors. You have increased fibrinogen and decreased fibrinolysis so that the placenta will hold on to the wall of the uterus. Well, unfortunately, when we have this, this increases our risk for DVT formation. Um, so patients who are pregnant or patients who are on birth control pills are at risk or any type of hormone supplement that includes estrogen, um, they're at risk for a deep vein thrombosis. So you want to look and make sure you don't see any changes that could equal that. And here's just an edema scale. Um, you can see we want to check for edema in the lower limbs. Um, it's normal to have edema in the lower limbs. But um, we don't really want it to be plus four. Plus four could tell us that we're having a lot of fluid escaping out of the vasculature, usually due to hypertension. Um, and you can see plus one is two millimeters, plus two is four millimeters, plus three is six millimeters, and plus four is eight millimeters. You can see she has plus four pitting edema. Um, not good. But um, we do expect for women to have some edema uh, during the end of pregnancy, just because your feet and legs are so far from your heart. Plus one, plus two, plus three, eh. Plus four, start to have some serious concern. Here's your DVT. You can see where this leg is bigger. It's red. If you ever think, hmm, I wonder if that leg is bigger, just go ahead and measure it. Just measure one, measure the other one, and you can say, yeah, there is a size discrepancy. You would want to report that and um, document that as well. Of course, don't get her out of the bed. Um, call for an immediate evaluation. Um, because if we do get her out of the bed, we can dislodge this deep vein thrombosis. It can go up this vein, go to the right atrium, uh, go to the right ventricle, and then get stuck in the pulmonary artery, which would then be a PE, a pulmonary embolism, um, which unfortunately is a, is a huge risk um, during pregnancy and thereafter. So we wouldn't want to get her out of the bed because we'd worry about a PE risk. Varicosities. Varicosities are just damaged veins. So you can see there's an incompetent valve, so you have some blood pooling. So normally valves stop the blood from pooling and stop the blood from going backwards, but you can see these valves are broken, and so you have this out bulging of these poor vessels. This is a problem during pregnancy because of the 1,500 extra fluid volume. Um, these, these, these valves who were you know, doing okay, got all this extra pressure on them, and then they just completely break, and then you have backflow. So this is what varicosities look like, and they can be painful because it's pressure um, um, on, on, their, on her legs. Um, you can see this is after pregnancy. Um, thrombophlebitis. So the difference, there's, people always get this confused. Um, superficial, which means top, superficial, thrombophlebitis, itis is an inflammation. Um, Superficial thrombophlebitis, you can see the vein and you can see redness and it's infected. Whereas a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis, you can't see. It's just red and swollen. The whole leg is red and swollen. This, we can actually see the vein and the inflammation. So the thing is, is on superficial thrombophlebitis, we should put warm packs on here um, so that we can get the blood to flow out. Whereas we would never want to put a warm pack on a deep vein thrombosis as we can make the problem that much worse and turn it into a PE. Um, we want to check DTRs, deep tendon reflexes, um, the afferent, efferent um, signals going up. Plus normal is plus one to plus two. Abnormally brisk is plus three. Mild central nervous system irritation, which can be from ICP, which can be from high blood pressure. Ominous is abnormal, which is plus four severe CNS irritation. Here's your patella reflexes. Always palpate out and find your patella. I hate it when people just start beating around because it just makes no sense. You've got to palpate, find that rubber band, which is the actual tendon, and then you can use the head of your stethoscope. You can use your hand or you can use your reflex hammer. And the reflex arc, so what will happen is you'll hit it. The afferent nerve system sends it to the dorsal root ganglia. If this CNS is super irritated, it's going to be very quickly down the efferent to have a more brisk um, reflex. So plus three and plus four is we've got some major CNS irritation or we've got some kind of lesion on the on the dorsal root ganglia. So that's why we check 
patellar reflexes because we know the more quick they are, the more CNS irritation there is. Plus four, we're worried about a seizure. Whenever we have a lot of CNS irritation, um, given especially ICP from third spacing of fluid outside of the vasculature, um, we know that this pressure on the brain can cause disorganized firing of the neurons. And that is what a seizure is, disorganized firing of the neurons. That's why they call it tonic-clonic because everything's not doing going the right way it's supposed to go. So DTRs are a great way for us to assess um, what's going on there. Um, evaluate for clonus. So you guys, once you have brisk DTRs, um, then you may have clonus. We're just going to click on this YouTube link real quick. I'm just going to show you. So what you would do um, when evaluating for clonus, here we go, is you're going to hold their knee and you're going to dorsiflex their toes. Okay, you're going to pull, pull back. And here we go. It's coming up. Sorry. So, guys, you can see where he pulls back on her toes, on her on her bottom of her foot. Hold on. Sorry. And her foot is going to shake back and forth with pressure. You see that? That's beats of clonus. So watch again. That's definitely plus four beats of clonus. So once you have any clonus, that's very concerning. Um, when you have, sorry about that. When, when you have one beat of clonus, that's a concern for a seizure because we know we have severe CNS irritation um, and we're concerned. But if we have four beats of clonus, it goes one, two, three, four, then we know we better get our seizure precautions ready because when mom seizes, she doesn't get oxygen, but more importantly, the baby does not get any oxygen. She uses it for her when she's seizing. So the baby gets none. And so a lot of times that's an emergency C-section. And that's it. So you guys, I want to show you your checkoff. Okay, so here's your checkoff and it's pretty easy. So I'll ask you to evaluate the color. Um, it should it be it should be pink or tan, um, red, gray, um, pale or jaundice is not good. Make sure you do your skin evaluation. Variants: Linnea nigra, Masculasma, striae, pups. Those are all normal things of pregnancy. But if you see ecchymosis, if you see bruising, that's not a good sign. We'd want to evaluate for domestic violence. You want to evaluate for the skin for MRSA. You'd want to look everywhere, especially on the back, um, where the epidural would be placed. Look all over. Um, on the face, check for facial, facial swelling. Um, you know, make sure you evaluate for that. Look for one-sided droop, which could be Bell's palsy or compression of the um, facial nerve due to high blood pressure. Sclera, look at the sclera. Are they white or are they jaundice? Check the eyes. Are they are they a normal dilation given the um, light in the room? Or, or are they overdilated? Are they blown? Or they, does she have pupillary constriction? And again, we'd want to look at drugs in both of those cases. Perla, pupils equal and reactive to light and accommodation. We want you to do that. EOM without nystagmus. We want you to do EOMs and pause in your corners, checking for nystagmus. If they have nystagmus, that's an abnormal finding, um, which can tell us that we have central nervous system irritation, probably due to high blood pressure. Mouth, we will look for lesions on the lips. If we see lesions on the lips, it could be HSV, herpes simplex virus. Very important to get her on some medication, a cyclovir, Valtrex, um, to get that under control because we do not want the baby to come into contact with any type of HSV as it can cause herpetic meningitis. Lesions on the mouth, in, well, in the mouth can be um, HSV lesions, herpes simplex, or HPV or condyloma. Condyloma are venereal warts. Um, you can get them in your mouth as well. Look for teeth. We look for broken teeth, chips teeth, loose teeth. Um, we don't want any. <laughs> and if they have a dental appliance, we tell them to take it out um, because we know it can be an anesthesia risk. We want you to look at the tonsils and grade them. Are they grade zero, surgically absent, one or two? Or are they grade three or four, which is an intubation risk? Um, tonsils should be the same size and should be without inflammation. Of course, I'm going to have you listen to aortic pulmonic herbs tricuspid and mitral. 
Um, you did this in health assessment. I know that you haven't been doing as many heart evaluations as you would like to have done. This is going to brush you up because we're going to do a lot of these in the hospital. So you're going to listen for S1. They may have an S2 or, or diastolic, I mean, a systolic murmur. That's fine. But make sure that you know all of your lower heart locations. Um, screening lung exam. And you are going to listen in the front in the apices, a pi, and in the bases, and then laterally. So you're going to do four in the front, two on the sides, four in the back. If you're hearing adventitious sounds, of course, we're going to do A8, 3, and 2. Um, they should be clear to respiration, to, clear to auscultation bilaterally. If we hear wheezes, we, we know that's a constriction. We find out about asthma, crackles, fluid, strider. That's an upper airway narrowing um, or a friction rub. Uh, the respiration should be 12 to 20. If they're tachypnic over 20, we start to be concerned. Why is she tachypnic? Is she not getting enough oxygen? What's going on? Or bradypneic? Um, oxygen saturation should be 95 to 100. If it's not, obviously, that is some um, decreased oxygenation. You're going to listen to bowel sounds in all four quadrants. You're going to do a field evaluations on Leopold's maneuver. You're going to do one, two, three, four. Um, measure the fundal height. And you're going to listen to the fetal heart tones. And you're going to tell us what is normal for fetal heart tones. Um, I have a little box, and it is a vaginal box, and you can measure effacement, dilation, and station with a vaginal exam. You just have to know what these three are and how you would do it. You just put your fingers in. Of course, I'm not going to expect you to know how to do one perfectly, but I just need you to understand the concepts, what it is, and why you would do it, and how you would do it. Um, of course, rupture membranes, if they're not ruptured, that's normal. Or if they are ruptured, it should be clear, should not have an odor or smell. It might have little uh, speckles of white in it, which is this white cottage cheesy substance called Burnix, which is actually just um, the baby skin um, trapped in in um, sebaceous oil on the outside of their skin. So it's really their skin cells trapped in oil that has this white covering on the baby. Totally normal, totally benign. Um, but this is why babies have that white cottage cheesy look sometimes when they come out. Um, we don't want there to be um, red for blood, black, meconium. When the baby gets has decreased oxygen in utero for whatever reason, for some type of event, um, maybe the baby squeezed the cord and passed out. Anytime that they have decreased oxygenation, they can have a meconium stool, which means they didn't get oxygen. They got all floppy, just like you would if you passed out. Their anal um, sphincter relaxes, and they release the contents of their gastrointestinal tract, which is meconium. The sad thing is, is they can aspirate that because, again, they use the fluid for increasing the strength of their lungs, and then they also swallow it to the amniotic fluid to um, improve their kidney function. Look at our lower limbs. You want They should be bilaterally the same size, same color. Um, deep tender reflexes should be plus 1 to plus 2, plus 3 to plus 4. We have some CNS irritation. Edema should be plus 1 to plus 3, plus 4. Too much third spacing. We might have some problems with the blood, the, the plasma leaving the vasculature and going into the third space, due, usually due to high blood pressure. Do I say that a lot? High blood pressure? Yes, I do, because so many people have high blood pressure. And then clonus um, should be negative. You're going to have to do this as well. Um, one beat is bad. It's a seizure risk, but plus four beats um, is an imminent seizure risk. And we worry about deoxygenation of the mom, injury of the mom, and, of course, deoxygenation of the baby. You will check off with this form with your clinical um, professor. Um, so uh, they will make an appointment. Well, they'll tell you when they're going to come, and you have to do all of these things head to toe. We will review these things on your first sim lab. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please post it to the discussion board, and I'm happy to answer.